While the Western media is still fixated on the war in Ukraine, we're seeing more and more unity in Asia, more and more integration economically and politically of different countries in Asia. And one of the main institutions at the heart of this process of Eurasian integration is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, or the SCO. The SCO now represents 40% of the global population, and its members include China, Russia, India, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. And Iran has just become a full member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Leaders of the organization held a virtual summit on July 4th, and Iran's president, Ibrahim Raisi, announced that Iran has officially become a full member. And in the same speech, he used it as an opportunity to call for de-dollarization, to call for countries in Asia to create new payment mechanisms and to do trade with each other in their own local currencies in order to challenge the hegemony of the West. That's the term he used, to challenge the hegemony of the dollar, which in turn provides the economic foundation for Western hegemony that has subordinated the countries of Asia and the global South. The Iranian media outlet Press TV published an article summarizing President Raisi's speech, and it said very clearly, ditching the dollar is key to shaping a fair international system. The article stated, quote, Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi has warned against the dominance of the dollar in global exchanges, saying de-dollarization is a pivotal necessity to form a just international system. The Iranian leader noted that militarism and the dominance of the dollar form the bases of the Western domination. And he said, quote, any attempt to shape a fair international system requires the removal of this instrument of dominance in intra-regional relations, and he called for the creation of new mechanisms to do trade in local currencies. Later on in this analysis, I'm going to actually look at the transcript of President Raisi's speech and go through some of the main points because I do think that this is a very important development geopolitically and economically. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization, although it's almost never discussed in Western media, represents 40% of the global population and about one third of the global economy. In addition to China, Russia, India, Pakistan, and Iran, other members include Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. And Belarus is very likely going to become a member in the summit in 2024. Other observer states include Mongolia and Afghanistan and dialogue partners. Other countries that have a diplomatic relationship with the SEO include Turkey, which of course is also a member of NATO, also Armenia, Azerbaijan, Cambodia, and Nepal, and also Egypt, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia, as well as Myanmar, Kuwait, and the United Arab Emirates. And many of these countries have also expressed interest in joining the BRICS bloc of Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. And in fact, some of these countries like the United Arab Emirates and Egypt have already joined the BRICS bank, the New Development Bank. So this is all part of a larger historic process of Eurasian integration. There are numerous institutions involved, including the SCO, which began as more of a security focused organization, although it's become more focused on economics as well. There's also BRICS. There's also the Eurasian Economic Union. This is very important because a key tenet of U.S. foreign policy for decades has been Washington's attempt to dominate Central Asia. This goes back really to the British Empire and British colonial strategists like Halford Mackinder, one of the famous founders of geopolitics as a discipline. He was a geographer and he was also a British parliamentarian and he was a big supporter of the British Empire and imperialism. And he had emphasized the need 
for the European colonial powers to prevent the integration of Eurasia. In particular, they were focused on weakening the Russian Empire. And his argument was that the center of global politics was the world island that consists of Eurasia and also Africa. And in particular, he talked about the need to dominate the heartland. And the heartland is located in modern day Central Asia, parts of West Asia and Russia. And his famous argument, Mackinder, this British imperialist, was that the Western colonial powers had to make sure that Eastern Europe would, would not be integrated with Asia because, as he wrote famously, quote, who rules East Europe commands the heartland, who rules the heartland commands the world island, who rules the world island commands the world. And this idea that goes back to the British Empire was adopted by U.S. imperial strategists during the first Cold War and especially prominent U.S. imperial strategists like Brzezinski, I'll come back to him later, he famously argued that the United States had to prevent the political and economic integration of Eurasia and make sure that the U.S. had geopolitical dominance over Eurasia, specifically over the heartland of Central Asia and Eastern Europe, in order to maintain global domination. So this is a significant reason why the United States and in general the Western NATO powers have been very wary of this project of Asian integration with Russia as well. And that's also one of the reasons why the United States has really been trying to separate divide the region and try to recruit India for an anti-China alliance. So I'll talk more about that later when I look at Brzezinski's writings. But before that, I want to talk about the economic implications of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And then I'm going to take a look at the speech that Iran's President Raisi gave at the summit. If you look at the share of global GDP, that is the size of the global economy, made up by the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The countries together represent about 32% of global GDP, about one third when you measure it at purchasing power parity, which is the best way to measure the size of an economy because instead of just converting everything directly to US dollars, which is what nominal GDP does, instead it uses the purchasing power of local currencies and uses the same basket of commodities around the world to make sure they're at the same level. And this is pretty significant. I mean, China does represent over half of the economic power of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization combined. China represents about 19% of the global economy. India represents about 7.5%. Russia, nearly 3%. Iran, about 1%, Pakistan, about 1%, and then the Central Asian republics combined have about half of a percent, a little over half of a percent. So this is about 32% total. That's, that's a very significant part of the global economy. If you compare it, for instance, to the G7 countries, which are the Western imperialist countries plus Japan, the G7 economies combined only represent 30% of the global economy. So that's to say that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, like the BRICS, and of course there's a lot of overlap between the SEO and the BRICS, they represent a larger share of the global economy than the G7, which consists of the United States, Japan, Germany, France, the UK, Italy, and Canada. Now, just as China represents over half of the, the economic power of the SEO, the United States represents about half of the G7's economic power. The US economy represents 15% of the global economy compared to Japan at nearly 4%, Germany at around 3%, France and the UK at around 2%, Italy at just under 2%, and Canada at 1.4%. So there are sometimes Western analysts who treat the Shanghai Cooperation Organization like the BRICS as something insignificant, unimportant economically. But we're talking about a region of the world, Eurasia, particularly Asia, where one, the majority of the global population lives, and increasingly it's becoming more and more important in the global economy, in particular in global manufacturing. If you go to the store and you find the products that you need to use in your everyday life, whether it's electronics like phones, computers, TVs, or appliances for your kitchen, you know, 
or clothing, look at where a lot of those products are made and you'll find that a lot of them are made in China or in other parts of Asia. I mean, Vietnam is increasingly a manufacturing power. Of course, Bangladesh has a massive textile industry, Indonesia. So it's very important to push back against the Eurocentric, West-centric view that sees a lot of these organizations like the BRICS and the SEO as unimportant. In reality, these organizations are ushering in a new global order politically and economically. In addition to manufacturing, if you look at commodities production, these countries are extremely important for the global economy. The first most obvious point is oil production. Russia is the world's third largest oil producer, and it constantly is competing with the United States and Saudi Arabia in the top three top oil producers in the world. China is also a very significant producer of oil. It's not talked about a lot. And Iran is in the top 10 consistently of global oil producers. According to data from the U.S. Energy Information Administration, the EIA, Russia represents around 11% of global oil production, China 5%, and Iran 4%. So taken together, they represent one-fifth, 20% of global oil production. That has a huge influence on global oil prices. And of course, when global oil prices change, it really impacts the rest of the economy, which is something that we've seen in the past two years with the inflation coming out of the pandemic and then with the war in Ukraine and the Western sanctions on Russia, as oil prices skyrocketed, it led to a lot of volatility and it fueled inflation in many different countries, which also caused political instability. Now, I also sh I should point out as well that Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates are both dialogue partners of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization that could potentially join. They've also expressed interest in joining BRICS. Saudi Arabia is the second biggest oil producer at 12%, and the United Arab Emirates is also constantly in the top 10 at about 4%, about the same level as Iran. So if you add them, we're talking about well over one-third of global oil production. If you look at global gas production, it's pretty similar. Once again, Russia is the world's second largest gas producer, and Iran is the third largest followed by China, which is the fourth largest. Russia, Iran, and China are members of the SCO. Qatar is the fifth largest producer, and Qatar recently became a dialogue partner of the SCO. And Saudi Arabia is a significant producer, along with, by the way, the Central Asian nations of Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. Kazakhstan is also an oil producer, and another commodity that Kazakhstan produces is gold. This is often forgotten, but China is actually the world's largest producer of gold. Russia is the second largest producer, and other significant producers include Uzbekistan and also Kazakhstan, which are members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. South Africa and Brazil are significant gold producers, and they're, of course, members of the BRICS. And Indonesia and Mexico, likewise, are major gold producers, and both of them have expressed interest in joining the BRICS as well. This is important because the BRICS bloc has been talking about creating a new global reserve currency to be held by central banks and their foreign exchange reserves, but also to be used for international trade in order to get off the U.S. dollar. And there has been discussion, in fact, the Russian government has said that it will be at least partially backed by gold. Now, there also may, may be other commodities that are used to back that currency, but gold will be one of them. Russia has said that. And the fact that many of these countries are significant gold producers is a major factor to consider as well. So that data I was looking at earlier, which is from the most recent data from the International Monetary Fund from April, that data shows simply the representation of the global economy, all of the goods and services produced by the combined economies of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. But if you look at more specific areas, in particular commodities production, you can see that these countries are very important in the global economy, and increasingly so. Now, what's interesting about the history of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is it has really evolved over time. It, was, it really began as a group of countries called the Shanghai Five in the 1990s, which consisted of China, Russia, 
and three Central Asian nations, and they were really focused on security. It was not really about economic integration. The main concern was resolving border disputes between these countries, but also it was a way of coordinating security to fight against extremist groups. And then in 2001, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization was formed as an extension of the Shanghai Five. And like I said, originally it was mostly focused on security issues, on border issues, and in particular, the fight against extremism and terrorism. Of course, in the 2000s, there was a lot of concern about this. And especially in Central Asia and also Russia, there were the wars with Chechnya, also with China, with issues in the West. And of course, the United States is on record of having a history of supporting some of these extremist groups in order to try to destabilize Russia and also destabilize China. So it was a way for these countries in specifically China and Russia and Central Asian nations to collaborate on security problems. And what has happened over time is it has expanded. India and Pakistan joined, now Iran has joined. And as it has expanded, it has also kind of evolved and the SEO members are no longer just talking about security issues, but they're increasingly focused on economic integration. Now, on the subject of the economic integration of Eurasia and de-dollarization, I want to go back to the speech that Iran's President Raisi delivered at the summit, the, at least the virtual summit of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization on July 4th. I do think that he said a lot of important things. And the Iranian media outlet Tasnim published the full transcript of Raisi's speech, and they published it with the headline, Benefit of Iran's SEO Membership to Go Down in History. Raisi talked about six areas in which cooperation in the SEO is important. The first one was on security. And again, the SEO was originally created as an organization mostly focused on security. And Raisi called for the importance of fighting terrorism and extremism, ensuring security and fighting a hegemony in the region. And when he says that, it's clearly a reference to Western domination, in particular, the U.S. military occupation of Syria, of Iraq, the constant U.S. invasions and bombs and drone strikes. And the Iranian president called for the region to be free from terrorism, extremism and separatism. Now, the choice of language here is important. The Iranian president specifically said the region should be free from terrorism, extremism, and separatism. That is clearly a message that is largely, and it's for all the countries in, in the SEO, but specifically for China, because the Chinese government has a concept it refers to as the three evils, which are religious extremism, terrorism, and separatism the exact problems that, the, that Iran says that it opposes. And this is also important because if we're talking about terrorism, the way that people usually talk about Islamist extremist terrorism, they're specifically talking about Salafi jihadi groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda, which are the exact opposite of Iran's Shia Islam. I cannot stress this enough because there's so much xenophobia and racism toward Iran and Iranians that tries to, because of U.S. government propaganda going back many years, they try to lump in Iran with these extremist groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, which, which actually have their origins in U.S. foreign policy, going back to the CIA's war against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, in which the U.S., uh, through the CIA and also Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, supported the Mujahideen, who were Salafi jihadist fundamentalists, extremist Sunnis who see Shia Muslims and in Iran, the majority of Muslims are Shia. They see them as apostates and they actually hate them and in many cases want to kill them. They hate them more than anyone else, more than Christians, more than Jews. They hate Shia Muslims. So Iran has helped to lead the fight against these extremist groups and terrorist groups in places like Syria and Iraq. And it was Iran that played the key role in defeating ISIS. And the Iran, by the way, the Iranian general who oversaw the defeat of ISIS in collaboration with Iraq and also with Lebanese Hezbollah 
which is the Lebanese resistance forces. The Iranian general who oversaw that was Qasem Soleimani, who was murdered by the United States, by U.S. President Trump. Donald Trump personally ordered drone strikes to murder the top Iranian general Qasem Soleimani in January 2020, and to also murder the top Iraqi general Abu Mahdi al-Mahandis, who had helped to lead the fight against ISIS in Iraq. So Iran has played a key role in fighting ISIS and Al-Qaeda, whereas U.S. foreign policy and the U.S. war on Syria strengthened ISIS and Al-Qaeda, and U.S. weapons ended up falling into the hands of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And there's been many reports about the U.S. sending weapons to so-called moderate rebels who joined ISIS or Al-Qaeda, or the weapons were taken and given to, they were taken by extremists from ISIS and Al-Qaeda. So the point is that, you know, Western propagandists will say, oh, it's absurd to hear Iran talking about fighting extremism and terrorism. But in fact, Iran has played a key role in fighting extremism and terrorism in the region, whereas the U.S. has played a key role in sponsoring these extremist groups in order to destabilize Iran, Syria, also Russia in Chechnya. The neoconservatives had, had all, all, for many years, had always called for supporting extremist groups in Chechnya to destabilize Russia, and Russia fought two wars with them, and also China, and of course, in the western provinces of China, the U.S. has a history of supporting these extremist groups. Also, Turkey is harboring a lot of these extremist and terrorist forces that are from western China. So when Iran says this, I mean, this is not just empty words. Iran actually does have a shared interest in combating these Salafi jihadist fundamentalist groups because many of them are blowing up Shia mosques and murdering Shias. So this is not just rhetoric from Iran. This is something that they're very serious about. They take extremely seriously along with China and Russia. Now, in the case of India and Pakistan, it's very complicated. And I'll talk later about there are some divisions within the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, especially between India and Pakistan. So I'll talk about that later. But anyway, I now want to talk about other points that are mentioned in the speech from Iran's President Raisi. And he talks about economic collaboration. And I think this is, for me, one of the most important areas of cooperation, because I mentioned that there are political disputes, especially between countries like India and Pakistan. But one thing that all of the countries in the SEO can agree upon is the need for economic integration and development, boosting trade, boosting technology transfer. And despite their political disputes, they can still work together to advance their economic integration. As an example of this, by the way, China still remains the U.S.'s top trading partner. In fact, despite all of the aggressive sanctions imposed on China by the United States, despite the U.S. new Cold War against China, despite the tech war and trade war Washington is waging against Beijing, in fact, U.S.-China trade has been increasing. So the point is that this economic cooperation within the, the Eurasian bloc has so much potential. And Iran recognized that, right? He said in his speech, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization comprises more than 60% of the population of the Eurasian region and more than 40% of the world's population. This huge capacity has given the organization wide potential to develop trade and deepen economic cooperation. Iran supports constructive initiatives such as the Global Development Initiative. And a very quick note on that. This is not really known about in the West. It's not really reported on a lot. But the Global Development Initiative is a United Nations-backed initiative that was created by China in 2021. President Xi announced it at the General Assembly in 2021. And there are over 100 countries that are already part of this initiative. And of course, the vast majority of them are in the global south. And as the name suggests, it's about promoting development. Specifically, China says the goals are a stronger, greener and healthier global development and fighting poverty, decreasing inequality, providing more economic integration and also finding ways to combat climate change. And if you go to the United Nations web, web page and you look at the list of countries that have joined, I mean, it's incredible. More than 100 countries, it's really massive. 
So when President Rayasi mentions this, this is another sign that he's communicating to China that Iran supports these Chinese-led diplomatic efforts. And of course, it does want to develop economically. And Rayasi also pointed out that the members of the SEO can cooperate in the fields of energy, technology, industry, agriculture, trade, and commerce. And he said they can open a clear vision of a just regional order for the nations of the world. He contrasts that against the Western dominated hegemonic order. And he said the Western hegemonic powers by resorting to economic coercion and sanctions have jeopardized the security and economic prosperity and the principles of fair trade in the world. That's another important line. He talks about the Western hegemonic powers challenging fair trade. He doesn't say free trade, fair trade. The global South needs fair trade. And Raisi said that the experience of past decades show that it's now quite evident that along with militarism, what forms the basis of the Western domination system has been the dominance of the dollar and therefore any attempt to shape a fair international system requires the removal of this instrument of dominance in interregional relations. So challenging the hegemony of the dollar and doing it by expanding the use of national currencies in international trade and financial exchanges between the members of this organization and their business partners. President Raisi said this requires more serious attention. So they want to prioritize how important this is going to be. And he said that the Islamic Republic of Iran welcomes any move to introduce financial payment instruments based on modern technologies to facilitate financial exchanges between members and business partners, especially in multilateral frameworks. Now, Iran has already done this. In fact, the Iranian Central Bank and the Russian Central Bank have signed agreements to integrate their bank messaging systems because many Russian banks have been sanctioned by the West and many Iranian banks, of course. So they've been blocked from the US controlled SWIFT interbank messaging system, which is based in Belgium. So Iran is talking about the importance of creating new institutions like this so countries in the region can trade with each other in their local currencies. In fact, Iran and Russia have been trading in their own currencies, Iranian rials and Russian rubles. Russia and China have been trading in Russian rubles and Chinese renminbi, Chinese yuan. And Russia and Iran have been trading in Russian rubles and Iranian rupees. So this is something that I think is going to continue in the future. And Iran is emphasizing the importance of this. Now, another element of Rice's speech, which is interesting, is the importance of sharing technological information and scientific research. And he pointed out that Iran does have expert human resources and significant achievements in the field of advanced technologies and modern sciences, which can strengthen multilateral economic cooperation. Iran, relying on its domestic power and indigenous knowledge, has been able to achieve high levels of scientific production, technology, biotechnology, medicine, nano, engineering, electronics, defense, and many knowledge-based areas requested by many countries for cooperation. He said Iran is ready to share its experiences and achievements while developing scientific and technological cooperation. Now, this is, this is true. It absolutely is true. And what's interesting is that Iran has been under sanctions for so long, since the revolution in 1979, that Iran has really developed its own unique technology, its own unique industries that don't rely on Western companies. And this is something that we've seen, for instance, in Venezuela. The Venezuelan oil sector for decades, well before the birth of Hugo Chavez, had been using technology from US oil companies mostly. So when the United States began imposing sanctions on Venezuela starting in 2015, when Barack Obama declared Venezuela absurdly with a, an executive order to be a so-called extraordinary and unusual threat to the national security of the United States and began imposing sanctions, it became very hard for Venezuela to replace equipment that was broken 
or they needed to be updated or modernized in its oil sector. And that led to a massive decrease in oil production. And then the U.S. sanctions on Venezuela expanded into a full on blockade, which just sabotaged the Venezuelan economy. And according to the top U.N. expert on sanctions, Venezuela lost lost 99 percent of its government revenue because it couldn't pr simply couldn't produce oil. And if it could produce oil, it couldn't export that oil. But anyway, the point is that Iran played a very important role in helping Venezuela to to help bring back its oil production and to help replace parts that it couldn't get from U.S. companies or, for instance, German companies or other European companies because of the sanctions. So Iran actually has really developed a lot of technology and scientific research that has been useful to countries that are suffering under sanctions. And now Iran, the Iranian President Raisi, is saying that they are willing to share that technology with other countries in the global south to have mutual development so they can work together to challenge Western hegemony. By the way, on the subject of science and technology in Iran, a little known fact is that the STEM sectors, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in Iran are actually heavily dominated by women. 70% of the people, the students studying science and engineering in Iranian universities are women. And, you know, there's a lot of Western propaganda about women's rights in Iran. And obviously, I mean, no country is perfect. And certainly there are things to criticize in Iran. But a lot of that's only fixated on the hijab, as if that's the only thing that matters for women's rights. They don't talk about the other ways in which actually women in Iran do play a very significant role in society and have state support and education. And if you, it, for instance, if you look at uh, Forbes reported, I mean, this is a Western business media outlet. I mean, they're in no way is sympathetic to Iran. They pointed out, quote, for years, women in Iran have owned and managed businesses, many of them in male dominant industries like oil and gas, construction, mining, and now tech. And now with such a high number graduating with degrees in science and engineering, there's a push to get women more involved in Iran's blossoming startup scene. So don't let Western simplistic propaganda just simply, you know, make you think that Iran is like some crazy backward medieval country. In many ways, Iran is very advanced. And by the way, when we're talking about the economy as well, a significant part of the Iranian economy is state owned. I mean, it has like this kind of resource nationalist model. And it's well known that in 1953, the CIA organized a coup against Iran's democratically elected nationalist prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, because he nationalized the oil, which had belonged to the, the Anglo-Iranian oil company, which is now known as BP, British Petroleum. And the CIA and British intelligence were behind this coup to overthrow him and install the Shah, the monarchy. But what's not talked about a lot is that in Iran, the oil and gas are state owned again. They're run by state-owned oil and gas companies. So really the Iranian economic model does incorporate a lot of the nationalist elements, even going back to Mossadegh and a lot of these leaders who were overthrown by the US or, you know, um, for instance, Arbenz in Guatemala. Obviously Iran is not a socialist country, but Mossadegh wasn't a socialist either. He was a nationalist and he was still overthrown by the US. And similarly today, I mean, the Iranian economic model is really a nationalist economic model. And of course, there are a lot of Islamist elements in cultural policy of the state. But you have to keep in mind the nationalist elements that have always angered Western capital that have wanted to get access to these these natural resources in Iran. They wanted them to be privatized. They also want to get access to key parts of the Iranian market that are dominated by some state owned enterprises. So again, I mean, we need to be we need to have a more nuanced perspective of these countries and not simply just regurgitate the Western propaganda that just wants us to think Iran bad. Uh, I mean, obviously, the situation is much more complex. And if we look at the speech from President Raisi, we can see a lot of very interesting and important things that he's talking about. In addition to expanding cooperation in science and technology, President Raisi called for expanding trade routes and in expanding the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure used so countries in Eurasia can trade more with each other. He said general economic development requires the expansion of transit and transportation links 
and roots in the region. He said that there are very valuable initiatives underway at the Eurasian level. He mentions that Iran supports the Belt and Road Initiative that China is overseeing. And he also mentioned something very important, which is almost never mentioned in the Western media. Cooperation of Iran and Russia on the completion of the North-South Corridor rail route. He said that it has entered its implementation stage. Ricey was referring to the International North-South Transport Corridor, INSTC, and this can really be a game changer for the integration of Eurasia for regional trade. And this will connect Russia going down through Iran and over to India. And if you look at a map, it shows that it will connect the port on the western coast of India in Mumbai and go up to southern Iran. And then there will be a railroad that goes through Iran and up to the north into the Caspian Sea, and then that will go into Russia, and then there will be railroads that connect going all the way up to St. Petersburg, and then that will connect to the Baltic Sea. What this will do is it will cut out Western Europe from this regional trade, because historically, a lot of this trade from India has gone to the west and up through the Red Sea, and then gone up through the Suez Canal from Egypt, and then gone into the Mediterranean, and then those goods have gone to countries in Western Europe. But that previous trade route took between 40 to 60 days in order to get to Russia at the end of it, after going through the Baltic as well. Now, this new transit route will go up through Iran from India, and it will cut the transit time nearly in half from between 40 to 60 days to between 25 and 30 days, and it will also reduce the cost by 30%. And furthermore, it will also simply encourage more trade within Asia instead of encouraging countries like India to trade more with Western Europe. And by the way, India's biggest trading partner is still the United States. So by creating these new trade routes, it will make it more cost effective and therefore it will be make much more economic sense for these countries to trade with each other instead of relying so much on the West. In his speech, Iranian President Raisi said that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization can facilitate the cooperation of member countries to advance and developing, develop existing transit projects and define new initiatives. So what he's saying is that the SEO has a lot of potential to help further increase the economic integration of Eurasia. It, this is no longer an organization focused solely or even necessarily primarily on security and border issues. This is an organization that more and more is now going to be focused on economic integration. And you can bet that this is going to infuriate the United States and imperial planners. And specifically at the beginning of my analysis today, I mentioned the if you go back to the European colonialists, specifically going back to Halford Mackinder, the the British colonial strategist and his idea of the Heartland thesis and the need for the Western European empires to prevent Eurasian integration in order to maintain dominance over the Heartland, to, to maintain control over the world island of Eurasia and Africa. I mean, this has been at the heart of Western imperial strategy for a hundred years. And we can see this very clearly in the writing of one of the most influential US foreign policy strategists that is Zbigniew Brzezinski. Brzezinski was a die-hard cold warrior, and he served as the national security advisor for US President Jimmy Carter. And in fact, he was the main, that one of the main architects of the US strategy to support the Mujahideen, these is Islamist extremist fundamentalists in Afghanistan, in order to fight a proxy war against the Soviet Union. And uh, Brzezinski also, by the way, came from a very wealthy, aristocratic family from Poland, and he was a diehard anti-communist and was played a role in the Cold War and overthrowing the socialist governments in Eastern Europe. Well, of course, later on, but he played a role in helping to set the stage, supporting a lot of these groups, these uh, anti-communist groups in Eastern Europe. And anyway, Brzezinski's magnum opus was the book, The Grand Chessboard, American Primacy and Its Geostrategic Imperatives. It was published back in 1997. 
And you can see clearly that he was drawing from a lot of the European colonial strategists like Mackinder, because right at the beginning of this book, in the introduction, he says very clearly, echoing the Heartland thesis of Mackinder, he says, ever since the continent started interacting politically, Eurasia has been the center of world power. And he said, for the first time ever, with the overthrow of the Soviet Union and the rise of the unipolar hegemonic order led by the United States, for the first time ever, a non-Eurasian power, that is the United States, has emerged not only as the key arbiter of Eurasian power relations, but as the world's paramount power. The United States is the sole and indeed the first truly global power. He says, however, Eurasia retains its geopolitical importance. And he stressed that whether or not the United States prevents the emergence of a dominant and antagonistic Eurasian power remains central to America's capacity to exercise global primacy. U.S. foreign policy must remain concerned with the geopolitical dimension and must employ its influence in Eurasia in a manner that creates a stable continental equilibrium with the United States as the political arbiter. Eurasia is thus the chessboard on which the struggle for global primacy continues to be played. This is why Washington is very wary of these institutions of Eurasian regional integration like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It is why the United States is trying to divide the countries that are members and specifically focusing on India. I mentioned earlier that, you know, it's not all rosy. The process of Eurasian integration is not simply just going forward full steam ahead without any problems perfectly. I mean, there are very serious internal contradictions, especially between India and Pakistan, of course, there are arch rivals historically, and India has long accused Pakistan of supporting Islamist extremist forces, and Pakistan has long criticized India for its brutal military policies in Kashmir and considers it to be occupied. And so there are a lot of there's a lot of bad blood between these countries. They have had fought wars between each other, at least at a lower scale. And they have border disputes along with India and China having border disputes. And the United States has been really exploiting this and trying to recruit India for its new Cold War against China. And by the way, the fact that this summit of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization was only held virtually, not in person, is a bad sign. And it was supposed to be held in New Delhi, in the capital of India, but India's far right Prime Minister Narendra Modi decided to cancel the in-person summit and instead he decided to only have it as a virtual summit and this actually angered some other members and there was some criticism in the media. It was referred to as a surprise decision, especially considering the fact that while he canceled the in-person summit, Modi prioritized his trip to the United States. In June, he had a very friendly trip over several days where he met with Joe Biden and they signed a bunch of strategic agreements and they also criticized China together in their meetings. I actually wrote an article analyzing that situation over at geopoliticaleconomy.com. It's titled, U.S. Woos India's Far-Right PM Modi to Help Wage New Cold War on China. That's a whole other long conversation. I don't have time for that. This, this episode's already long enough today. But the point is to show that there are weaknesses. I mean, India is also a member of the anti-China NATO. It's called known as the, the Asian NATO or the Pacific Indo-Pacific NATO, which is the quadrilateral security dialogue, the Quad. And India is a member along with Australia and Japan. So the Shanghai Cooperation Organization has internal contradictions. And I would say that really... The driving forces of Eurasian integration are China, Russia, and Iran. India plays a very complicated role. It's still trying to maintain very close ties with the West, while also it has good ties with Russia, which go back historically to when, you know, go back well before the rise of the far-right BJP party in India, going back to the foundation of India with independence from British colonialism in 1947. 
and it leaned more toward its alliance with the Soviet Union at the time. And then India, the, the, the leftist president of India, the left wing nationalist president Nehru was one of the co-founders of the online movement. And also India's biggest uh, oil provider is Russia. Also Russia sells India a lot of wheat and fertilizer, which it needs for its economy and for feeding people. And Russia is the biggest provider of military equipment and weapons for the Indian military. So there's a long time historic relationship there. And India is kind of playing both sides, the West against the East here. And that is a very complicated contradiction within the SEO. Furthermore, Pakistan plays a complicated role. Now, previously, when Pakistan had Prime Minister Imran Khan, he had a very favorable view of regional integration. He significantly improved relations with Russia. In fact, he was in Moscow on the day that Russia initiated this new phase of the war in Ukraine that began with the US-backed coup in 2014 with this Russian invasion in February 2022. He refused to condemn Russia, which is a factor in the Western-backed coup, the US-backed coup that overthrew Imran Khan in Pakistan. And since then, for the past year, Pakistan has basically been run by the military with a military regime, very brutal. And the military in Pakistan is trying to maintain good relations with the West. The former chief of the military, General Bajwa, went to Washington and had a meeting with a bunch of top U.S. officials. So Pakistan also plays a complicated role. If Imran Khan can come back in Pakistan, it's very likely that he will kickstart more and more regional integration with China and Russia and Iran as well. So there's a lot of interesting things happening there, but Pakistan's role is, is a little complicated as well as India's. Again, the real lifeblood of the regional integration process in Eurasia is China, Russia, and Iran. And by the way, ironically, this is exactly what US imperial strategist Brzezinski warned about back in his book, The Grand Chessboard in 1997. He said, the most dangerous scenario for U.S. imperialism for the unipolar hegemonic order created by the United States. The most dangerous scenario would be a grand coalition of China, Russia, and perhaps Iran. An anti-hegemonic coalition united not by ideology, but by complementary grievances. This is exactly what we're seeing today in organizations like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And by the way, Iran has applied to join the BRICS system. So... I mean, this is a very interesting historical development. It is the nightmare scenario for the imperialists in Washington. And it's a big reason why the unipolar imperial order that those strategists in Washington tried to create in the 1990s has collapsed. And it's something that I report on regularly here at Geopolitical Economy Report. I think this is a good note to end on. This is a historic development, Iran's a session to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I expect it to grow further along with the BRICS and the BRICS summit in August, I think is gonna have a lot of interesting news and I will be reporting on it here. I wanna thank everyone for watching or listening to this very long episode. Please subscribe on whatever platform you're watching or listening on, especially on YouTube. It, helped, it really helps to promote our material in the algorithm so it's not suppressed. Please subscribe. And if you want to support the work that we do here, you can donate in several different ways. Please consider going to geopoliticaleconomy.com slash support. The best way you can support us is you can become a patron over at patreon.com slash geopoliticaleconomy. We have no institutional support. We're totally independent. We're grassroots. We have no big sponsors. We rely entirely on small donations from viewers and listeners like you. I want to thank everyone. I'll see you next time.